Hey, little sister, what's the worst show ever? That gets my goat. Hey, Big. Do you want to build a snowman? Tell me more. I don't know any other lines. Okay. Well, that's the end, then. Yes. Thanks for listening, folks. Good night. <laughs> All right, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Good and night. We're back for more Frozen. And we're not even frozen. It's 45 degrees outside still. That's nice, man. Yeah, I haven't seen weather like this in a month. It's been sub-zero for most of December, so I'm glad December's gone and January is upon us. So, so just in yes. the last episode, we talked about other stuff that surrounded Frozen, like the uh, advertising campaign and the pre-show cartoon. Now we'll go ahead and talk about the uh, movie itself. That's right. Disney's first ever lesbian fairy tale brought to you by Always. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Maybe Thanks. you should talk first. I, it's too uh, late. You already talked first. I did talk first, but I can be si- I can try to be silent for a no. minute, like uh, Dave Robinson was that one time we were on his show. Oh, wow, listen to my engine go. We're just about to the top of the hill, folks. Then you'll be able to hear us again. Okay. Okay, so it was loosely based on Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen. And I'm not as upset about them changing the title from The Snow Queen as I was with Rapunzel, as I was with other things, because it's so loosely based on The Snow Queen that it's almost dishonest to call it Disney's The Snow Queen. You know what I mean? No, they called it Disney's The Snow Queen. Then they'd be being honest about it. Oh, okay. (laughs) It's like Disney's completely reworked The Snow Queen. But if they just called it The Snow Queen, then, yeah. Come on. The build-up of this movie, as I said last time, was a little bit daunting to me. I have a guy that I work with at, at, at my job that is a really big Disney file, and he would sing the songs, and he would tell me about, oh, and then there's this part, and I'd be like, oh, hey, hey, I'll eventually see it. Don't tell me. And he's like, oh, okay, well, let me just tell you this one thing. <laughs> and... I asked him at one point, because, you know, he had seen it three times, I think, by the, this point. I said, okay, now that has, the time has come where you do the compare and contrast. I want you to say better than or worse than. And so I started out with, like, worst of the worst, which you know what I think is worst of the worst. And you think it's Brother Bear. I think it's Home on the Range. And, you know, he would be, like, better than. And, and so I would go up in quality, up in quality. And when we got to, like better than Mulan and better than Aladdin or something like that. I was just like, oh, wow, really? And I think that that painted my expectations a little bit. And when the movie first started, I think I probably had little tight fists at the side. And I was like, go ahead, convince me this is better than Mulan. And it was the damned, do you want to build a snowman song at the very beginning that melted my little fists. It melted your side. block of ice that you harvested from the lake? It did. That block of ice harvesting thing from the lake was weird. That reminded me of Mulan. It was just such a manliness thing going yeah, on. Yeah, and it did Let's get down to business. It didn't seem to belong, really. It was just like, here in the past, for our <laughs> secondary character... <laughs> Okay. Oh, by the way, uh, there will surely be spoilers in this uh, conversation. So if you haven't seen the film, you may want to pause now, go see it, and then come back and resume it in the car after you're done. Just to let you know, because I'm sure we will spoil a thing or two. Just like Rish's friend at work spoiled things for him. So the Want to Build a Snowman song is what melted your frozen heart. I guess so. I mean, the movie starts out, well, there's that throwaway ice blocking sequence and I I don't know if it's an afterthought or you know something that they added at the end because it's like we've got to puff up this character this male character so that we have something to market the film on in the same way that Finn or whatever his name is was puffed way up for Tangled afterward if you ever watch like the deleted scenes on that Tangled Blu-ray or maybe it might be on the regular DVD yeah, it was originally a Disney fairy tale princess 
story where they open the book and, you know, they have like an Angela Lansbury type saying, once upon a time in a faraway land and all that. And all that was thrown out. We've had this conversation. It was by the marketing people who are just like, somebody somewhere is not going to go see a movie called Rapunzel with a girl with blonde hair in it. Let's have it be about a boy. Let's have him narrate it. Let's fire the voice actors and hire people you've heard of to be the voices. And there is that. But the movie starts out really quickly after the ice blocking to introduce these two sisters, two young girls, princesses. Uh, Elsa is the elder and Anna is the younger and they're the best of friends. And Elsa has the ability to control ice, to, con to bring ice forth from the atmosphere. Uh, apparently there's actually a word <laughs> for it. Yeah. For that ability. Power, it's like that story that we ran about the kid beach combing, I think, who touched people. And he could get a feeling from the, or no, touch things and get a feeling from it. And there's actually a word for that too. Yeah, which for, I also for like the tactile, uh, tactile dysfunction. But that's been around for a long time. I don't know. I, yeah, it's funny. I guess I just assumed Stan Lee created that, that whole thing of making ice from the the air. There is no water in this air. What's your excuse? Run out of muscle? Right. Sorry. But anyway, the, the two are having a, a fun time with Elsa using her powers, and then she accidentally kills her sister. Oh, oh, you didn't see the movie? She killed her sister, assholes. And they take her, the body of Anna, to these these trolls. Is it trolls? Yeah. And these, tr these, these Smurf-like trolls. What they looked like were the evil Smurfs in Smurf 2. Which chances are were just ripped off of the frozen designs, <laughs> but I don't know. They needed, I'm, I'm, they needed those long, the really tall, poofy hairs like those trolls that you. Yeah, the troll dolls. Yes. Yeah. Too bad they didn't go there. Anyway, they say, "Oh, the damage is to her head, which is easily repairable. If the damage had been to her heart, she'd be foshed. And so they're able to heal her, but the uh, story convention fairy says. We've got to remove all memory of her sister's magic from her mind in order to heal her. No, do not question. <laughs> it's best if we never tell her that there's any powers. It's best if we keep this a secret so that when it finally comes out, it can ruin everything. And Anna and Elsa go back to their castle. The parents die off screen in a shipwreck, which was so poorly done. I didn't realize that it was the parents. I thought Anna and Elsa had died. I thought the credits were now to roll. I was disappointed <laughs> when they weren't. Then Anna sings, would you like to build a snowman? And my little fists of, I am not going to like this movie, unclench. And I started to be more than a little moved. And uh, Yeah, it was very strange, the story convention fairy thing where they said they had to hide away this special talent that she has or something. Yeah, the worst part didn't explain, is that like, when her parents choose to die needlessly just to teach their son that they can never, ever use their power for good. It just seemed like, well, that's maybe not the best lesson that you could die for. Oh, well, I'm sorry. You're mixing it up, and you're not supposed to talk about that movie anymore. <laughs> yeah. On New Year's, my family was talking about that movie again. I still insisted that it wasn't a bad movie, some of them, including my brother-in-law, who, of course, as long as there's an, a Superman symbol in the movie, he loves it. Because he's that much into Superman, but... Uh, could just be like, you know, uh, it could be a Will Ferrell movie where he happens to wear a Superman t-shirt while driving a race car or something, and he loves it, but... Yeah, someday we'll have to do an episode of why that movie is so bad. Someday we will. But not today. <coughs> today we're ahead. talking about Frozone. Okay, so the parents die because it's a Disney film, and and at first I was just like, well, that's vexing. What? What? Why? But... In retrospect, I understand that the parents had to die. Otherwise, these characters, I guess, would have grown up and lived their lives. But because the parents die, they're forever stuck at the age, the child age. You know what I mean? There's never, I guess they call that arrested development. There's never any advancement beyond where they were when their mom and dad died. 
they're surrounded by like servants and all that, but apparently the servants have nothing to do with these children and no influence on them at all. Yeah, it, it, it was very strange, I'll have to admit. The, the whole thing, like they said, okay, we're going to hide your power away. And this is the palace that rules a nation. And yet somehow they're like, oh, we're just going to close all the doors and nobody's ever going to come in. And we're all done with that whole, you know, outside world thing. But yet, who ruled the nation during those years? Right. No one ruled the nation, apparently. When they introduced the, the guy with the funny name, the DreamWorks name, I assumed, oh, okay, he's the guy. He's been the, uh, he's been Denethor. He's, he's been the, the steward regent, of Gondor. The steward, yeah, steward who's been running things until the girl came of age. I thought that that's what they, where they were going. And maybe in an earlier iteration of the story, that's what had been going on. But I don't think so. I don't think that there had been any ruling. That was Alan Tudyk, by the way. Was the How many? That guy. How many does Two. he have? Two. Oh my gosh. And you thought it was about lesbianism. I guess I was wrong. <laughs> anyway, it's Elsa's something birthday. Let's just pretend 18th. She was clearly in her 40s, but let's pretend it was her 18th birthday. And... They're going to reopen the castle for her uh, coronation, and they're going to have like a ball, and all the townspeople are going to get to see her. And there's been no progression at all in controlling her powers in all this time. And, and again, it sounds like I friggin' hate this movie, the way I'm <laughs> describing it, which it was, is not the case. I mean, I think it's the sister, Anna, is the reason I do not hate this movie. Anna was so delightful, so... Uh, lively and alive and something that's got the root word in life affirming and just I just dug the crap out of this character and she's the main character of Frozen not Elsa right and uh, she just can't wait to be king or to look <laughs> at this stuff isn't it neat or uh, you've never had a friend like her wait she, no that's we've not. never had a friend like her She's and got to stay isn't one step this ahead amazing? It's my favorite part because you see, here's where she meets Prince Charming, but she doesn't realize it's him till chapter three. Chapter three. This girl was, you know, the one that we hang all of our hopes on, and she just couldn't wait to meet everybody. And she's a beauty, but a funny girl. That's right. And she uh, just, you know, delights in socializing and and getting out of her shell. The the self-imposed. You know, maybe there needed to be a scene where Elsa is like, I am the eldest daughter, and what I say goes, and we will not open these doors again, and we will not socialize with the rest of the kingdom. We will, In fact, we are going to stay little girls forever, thus saith the princess. And that would explain why this state of arrested development happened. But anyway, she meets this handsome prince... And they fall in love. It's in the time it takes for one song, they have fallen in love. And he says, here, I've got a crazy idea. Will you marry me? And she says, I've got a crazy idea. Yes. Yeah, that was uh, interesting. They had, you know, the whole, like they met with uh, the boat and the horse. And it was, it seemed to very much like this guy was from Tangled when he hopped out with his horse and, you know, the boat and the whole thing. And then their little meeting was was very much, it seemed, reminiscent of that. And then, uh, of course, Tangled had more to their romance than that. But, yeah, I love the part where they did the robot dance <laughs> together. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Well, anyhow, this is still all before the inciting incident, really. I mean, yeah. I the inciting incident is Anna tells Elsa that this is my new fiancé and we're going to get married. And Elsa says, you just met this guy. Are you out of your mind? What is this, a fudge and Disney cartoon? Go to your room. And she says, Daddy, I'm 16. Daddy, I I'm love you. I'm not a him. child anymore. <sighs> then all hell breaks loose because Elsa's been trying to hold in her uh, adolescence metaphor for so long and then it just bursts out and uh, was there a song or was it just Alan Tudyk saying she's a monster look a monster kill the beast we're um, not safe until he's dead 
And I've got a spike to put on his head. Wait, that that's doesn't right. Quite work. Elsa's a monster. A monster. She's got white hair and too many teeth, and that makes her a monster. And yeah, so, there wasn't a song. No, sorry. Oh. I don't know what the hell this is. That you're remembering. You're freaking me out, though. Anyway, Elsa uh, is accused of being a monster, and she runs down into the village, and she once again loses her powers, and people are afraid, and a child cries. And no. Then, and she's like, oh, okay, well, F it then. I will no longer try. And she turns the world into a winter wonderland. She freezes time into a perpetual winter, and she goes up onto the mountain and builds an ice castle in a spectacular scene where they steal the song from Wicked. In fact, Elsa is the girl from Wicked. And I didn't realize that until afterward, and I was just like, oh, okay. Well, duh, I, I, how did I not make the connection? Because the name wasn't familiar to me, the girl that voiced Elsa. Kristen Bell was familiar to me as Anna, but I was just like, I don't know who this other one was, but if I had seen her up, astride her broom, I would have known. She sings this song. Now, this is the song that everybody talks about. I think it's called Let It Go. Yes. I think it's because Demi Lovato, I believe it was, does a version of it yeah. at the end that they play in the credits. That plays on the radio and stuff like that. From what I understand, I don't... I haven't seen... And you don't find Demi Lovato attractive. So what is her purpose to you? No purpose. Okay. Well, then, then, then I think we can understand She is nothing another. more than a friggin' judge on one of those terrible singing reality shows. Okay. And so that's the inciting incident, really. Elsa uses her abilities. She stops holding in her power, and she makes everything winter, and she goes and isolates herself up on the hill, and Anna thinks that it's her fault, and so she decides to go up and try and deal with her to try and convince her to fix the world. And she places her fiancé in control of the kingdom while she goes. And along the way, she meets Sven, right? No, Svetlana. No? What's his uh, name? Bjorn. I think it was... No, Sven was the name of the reindeer, reindeer wasn't it? Carl? Bjorn. We'll just say his name's Bjorn. She meets the this, this new guy. Now, dude, I have seen a lot of movies... I honestly did not realize what was going on. This is like this strapping, adventurous, good-hearted dude who saw something years before and then he's out of the movie. He was the ice... ice he was the skater. ice boy, yeah. And his best friend is Sven the reindeer, and they share carrots. And she hires this guy to take her up the mountain, and they have various adventures and they learn to understand one another along the way. And then, yes, they do run into an enchanted snowman way late in the movie. And the snowman's name is Olaf. And he likes warm hugs. <laughs> he does like warm hugs. <laughs> and you know, I should have hated the hell out of this guy, and I did not. I thought he was cute, I thought he was charming, I thought he was likable, and I thought he was only in the movie enough that he didn't wear out his welcome. But that's just me. It's funny. Uh, here and there, there's characters that you assume. You know, you see them in the trailers, and you're like, oh, I'm going to hate this character. You think it's going to be Jar Jar Binks for some reason. And apparently most filmmakers have enough control to not create a new Jar Jar Binks, unlike Lucas. And so... The character never turns out to be quite as bad as you thought it probably was going to be. And Olaf was definitely one of those. He was, he was cute. He was funny. He, he babbled a lot. Uh, he sings that song about summer. He can't oh, wait yeah. for summer to come. And that was, it was endearing. He was just, I, you know, I, if I didn't know better, I would say that the filmmakers were actively trying not to have this be an annoying character. They were trying to make him quirky and likable and endearing and a joy from beginning to end because they we've all seen characters that are meant to be the comic relief, that are meant to be the cutesy, let's sell a lot of dolls, character that don't work, that suck, that grate on your nerves, that ruin the whole picture. 
And I, I, that's if I had to guess, I'd say that these guys were trying really hard to have this character not be that. Anyway, the movie goes through, and, and it has one more major twist, which, again, I've seen a lot of movies. I did not see this twist coming at all. It turns out that the Disney love interest guy is an asshole, and he was manipulating things so that she would give him power over the kingdom. And I was just like, wow, where did that come from? Now, maybe other people saw it, but I just, I didn't. Yeah, I figured... I, I didn't know where they were going to go with it, but obviously when Bjorn, or whatever his name really is, came into the picture and then they started making Bjorn become, you know, and they had that whole song with the trolls where they... Uh, a fixer-upper one. Yeah, they sang about how uh, they needed to get married and tried to make them get married and right on the spot and all that stuff. And you knew that obviously he was probably going to be the guy, but... I didn't. I thought, okay, well, he's going to fall in love with Elsa if they ever meet. Yeah, I, I couldn't figure out what the deal was going to be. It just seemed so strange, the whole thing. And, the, and up until that point, I mean, even after Anna was gone, do you remember what the guy's name was? The, the good... The one who turned out to be an asshole? I don't. I'm sorry. I, I should have written it down. either, but... Yeah, this guy, he was back and in charge of the town and everything, and he was doing everything like you would think a devoted fiancé would. There was never a suspicion whatsoever, which I think might be why you never saw it coming, because he never let on to the fact that he was somebody that he wasn't. There was no giveaway to it at all not a single clue and see when the ice seller was like you got engaged to somebody the same day you met them he, he can't get past this I was just like have you never seen one of these things guy let it go <laughs> of course she got engaged to a guy the day that she met him that's how romance works this is and a Disney movie come on Snow White Married the guy that she had never seen before. And I should so have... Kissed her. I should have seen what they were doing, but I, I just didn't. I was just carried along, and I accepted it in the same way that I accepted, oh, okay, so Elsa has never worked on controlling her powers until that day. She just sat in that room Just like, so Elsa always. and Anna have never spoken in all the years since that day. I just accepted it because it was like, well, that's what you're telling us to accept. Yeah. And, uh, anyway, yeah, he turns out to be a bad guy, and, oh, we missed the part where Elsa and, and Anna have their big confrontation, and Anna is trying to get through to Elsa, and Elsa has brought to life this ice monster to be her sentry or whatever. A really neat design. It was voiced by the Hulk. I don't know why. <laughs> and I guess... Elsa, her heart has become so cold that even her sister can't touch it, and she sets this monster onto her. Oh, actually, no. The the Alan Tudyk character sent a couple guys to assassinate yeah. the queen, and she's able to hold back her power. But then, when somebody walks in, they immediately assume that she's trying to kill them, because again, that's just what we're expected to believe, and. Uh, and so, yeah, they sort of make an enemy out of Elsa, and Elsa accidentally yeah. harms her sister. She gets her in the heart. She gets her back. in the heart this time. And uh, why do I not remember this guy's name? Stefan or... S S no, Stefan Rudnicki? Sven was the Sven was the animal. reindeer. He's Kristoff, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it is Kristoff. Kristoff is the ice guy. From now on, we'll call him Kristoff. He uh, tries to whisk nice. Anna back before the damage is done from this injury that she's got from her sister. Oh, he's, yeah, that's right. She, he does take her to his take foster to parents, which are the trolls, and there are there is that song. How is Elsa captured? Does she go back she to... She isn't captured. They say that she needs a true love's kiss to uh, save her. No, an act she, of true love. She, she was needs. captured, though. 
And so they take her back so that pretend bad guy can kiss her because they're true loves. Oh, okay. we are talking Elsa, not Anna. Yeah, Elsa ends up with these things over her hands and she's in a dungeon and I don't remember how that happened. I don't either. She goes back to the village to save her sister, I would assume, and ends up getting captured. Yeah, that might be it. I don't recall either. That's interesting. Uh, you know, I think this is the first time we've ever done this, where we just tell the story of the yeah, movie. Yeah, or do we need to tell that much of the story of the movie? <laughs> I don't know. I don't care. It's just, <laughs> I just thought it would be fun to try and tell it. Yeah, so the truth comes out that the guy that is placed in charge of the kingdom is, is up to no good. He wants to kill... Oh, in fact, I believe he decrees that Elsa must die. Anna is dying anyway. We think that his true love kiss is going to save her, but he doesn't love her at all. He just wants to kill her. And, uh, and at this point, all of the males exit the film. And it becomes about the two sisters again. And there's just this big conf confrontation where all of the male bad guys are going to kill Elsa, whose power has come to her, you know, her, her true fruition, and she's, you know, she's this great threat to the kingdom. But we don't, but, you know, the people in the kingdom don't realize that she's actually trying to save her sister. The sister, uh, Elsa, Anna finally succumbs, right? And she turns into ice. And, uh, she turns into ice oh, just the, as she saves that's her right. sister. Kristoff is trying to get back to Anna because he realizes he loves her and that he can break the spell. And, yeah, I was just waiting for that to happen. And it doesn't happen. She, she succumbs to her curse before that can happen. And she uh, runs. She's about to kiss Kristoff. And then she sees... Her, her, her fiancé guy about to kill with a sword her sister and she runs and jumps in the way instead she ditches her man who's about to kiss her and save her jumps in the way and she turns to ice and the ice shatters his sword as he tries to hit his sister and uh and yeah suddenly I'm like oh it is a Hans Christian Andersen <laughs> story does end badly I'm, like everything I am does. so naive that I thought wow they really did it but it turns out that her love for her sister breaks the spell that these two have love for one another and that's enough to fix everything and Anna comes back and you know and again I, I was I kept waiting for Anna to develop powers I was like, well, yeah. Anna is going to be able to warm things. That's what her power is going to be. And she's going to be able to bring back spring. Yeah, uh, I thought that might have been an interesting way to go. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I don't know if I may have possibly even liked it better if, if they realized that they were like a pair and that, you know, they worked together and she could make the snow and then she could make the warm. I, I thought that's that where they were going. And once again, I was surprised that's not where they went. Anna and Elsa love one another and that heals everything and, and they realize that they're stronger together than they are separate and luckily we do get a very tiny little coda that the romantic subplot is not over and that Anna and Kristoff, you know, might live happily ever to, after together. Uh, and now Elsa can make, you know, her ice magic happened to the delight of the townspeople everywhere instead of to their horror. <laughs> it's one of those things it, it had kind of a really convenient seeming ending. It was like the end of X-Men 3 for example, where the mutants go to San Francisco and they rip the Golden Gate Bridge right out of the ground and fly it over and drop it on top of Alcatraz, they have this gigantic fight, there's death and destruction everywhere, and then when Wolverine manages to kill off uh, the Phoenix, then everything is just fine. And they show the little post, you know, the, the, the little coda where Beast is somehow 
a ambassador for something or whatever, and they're like, he's not just an ambassador for the mutants, he's an ambassador for everybody, because we all accept mutants now, no one dislikes mutants, because, well, there's no damn reason why, but we just do, you know, it, it kind of seemed a lot like that, where, yeah, now she can just like, okay, is everybody ready? Let's go ice skating. I'm going to make some ice. And you all love that. Maybe she can control herself enough that she can do it in a nice way instead of in a out of control way. And that's good. And, but, you know, it, they didn't, well, no, what they didn't probably... hate her to begin with because she was out of control. She made something in that little room and everybody's like, ah, she's a witch. Burn her, burn her. Ah. Well, it, it had the classic quandary that we've seen in so many movies where if you would only take three sentences to explain, everything would be fine. If she had only taken three sentences out of the last ten years to talk to her little sister and explain, everything would be okay. And maybe that's what happened at the end. She's like, okay, here's three sentences. A, I have the ability to make ice. Two, sometimes it's hard for me to control it, but I'm trying. Three, I like you all. Yay! <laughs> That's all it would have taken. I don't know. I, in, in describing this movie, it sounds as though I didn't like it at all. Quite the contrary. I liked it more than I've liked uh, a movie in a long, long time. I, just the songs were so great. The characters were so f wonderfully drawn. I thought Frozen was awesome. It spoke to the little girl inside me. And... The one you ate a long time ago? Yeah. Well, I, I had skipped breakfast. And uh, I guess that uh, I have a very cynical way of describing these things. But it's just... It, it, sometimes there are plot holes in a movie. And you can get past them because of the way the movie is told. Uh, you're just like, yeah, okay, I'm fine with that. You know what I mean? It's like, well... A, a space station that can destroy planets has to go around a planet before it can destroy the rebel base. Yeah. For 30 years, that has been a huge plot hole in Star Wars. I don't Never care. Seen. Nobody cares. Yeah, it's it's funny that, you know, all those kind of plot holes, you'll see those little videos, the how it should have ended web video series or whatever they are called. And that's what they'll do is point out plot holes where, oh yeah, this should have ended it right here because of this. And yeah, those are things that you just accept. You don't even think about it. You're like, oh, oh yeah. Sometimes you'll notice those. Or sometimes afterwards you'll be doing a podcast and you'll describe it in such a way that you realize, wow, this sounds like I didn't like it at all. But you'll accept things like that. There's just certain things Maybe it's because of the conventions of the type of story that it is that you'll accept Well, it. yeah, it's a fairy tale. And at the very beginning of a fairy tale, usually they set up that this isn't your our world, that this is, you know, this is a story more than something that actually factually happened. And so just go with it. The best of all the Disney animated films ends with the beast being transformed into the absolutely worst designed prince character. It should be a deal breaker for the Beauty and the Beast. He's just so badly designed. And yet, I'm okay with it. I've always been okay with it. Because they had me all the way until the end of the movie. And because the, the magic of the movie has carried me through. Uh-huh. When the beast turns into a prince and the prince turns out to be uglier than the beast was you're just like well all right it's fine sometimes women like ugly guys and nobody knows why they need to make more movies like that <laughs> maybe your acting career would take off yeah well it's all it's all the abc and cbs sitcoms where hot chicks like fat guys yeah or i need to get in on acting for that anyhow uh, be the king of queens I just have two things to say about the movie. One of them, the songs were written by a husband and wife team who I had never heard of. And so I did go on to find out what they had done before. And the husband and wife team did do that Winnie the Pooh. And the husband wrote 
some of the music for Avenue Q and for the Book of Mormon musical. Okay. And so they they have he at least has been so Riz, Riz heard of. But well, I do remember when my coworker was saying, "Do you want to build a snowman?" I was just like, "What, Barbara?" And uh, I'd say, "Who did the music for these?" Because I assumed if he Alan said Tim Lincoln. Rice or you know he said somebody, I'd be like, "Oh, okay, I know that." But he'd said the names, and I they didn't ring a bell for me. But but Trey you know Parker. what? That's fine. When Mencken and Ashman first came, you know, on the scene in The Little Mermaid, if I had been old enough to say, "Who are these guys?" All that they would have had under the belt, their belt was Little Shop of Horrors. Uh-huh. You know, so so the greats have to start somewhere. Anyway, so that was the one thing I wanted to say. I thought the songs were really, really excellent. I could have used a reprise of "Do You Want to Build a Snowman" after Anna died at the end, but that's all right. I was still crying. No worries. Yeah, that would have been good when she freezes into ice and then she tries to get her to come back out or something. It says, do you want to build a snowman? Or and how then, about a person made of ice? Oh, oh we already did that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> then the other thing that I wanted to say was the director was a woman. Main characters were all women. The head screenwriter was a woman. The songs, the lyrics were all written by a woman. And I was just like, well, okay, you know, this is what women are capable of we probably should have more of these made by women because this is really, really good. And if Man of Steel is indicative of what can be made by men, I never need to see a movie made by a man again. <laughs> good night. Okay, so... There you go. Now I'm done. You can talk. Okay, well, now that you're done, um, I have a question for you. You started off by saying this is the first lesbian show. We haven't spoken upon lesbianism since. Why do you call this the first lesbian show? Just because the Snow Queen remains non, they don't, not affiliated to a prince? The spell is broken by love, but it's not the love between a man and a woman. It's the love between a woman and a woman. Okay. It's the, the romance with Kristoff and Anna is incidental. Uh-huh. I mean, thank goodness totally. we got a... A coda, like I said, at the end to show, hey, there is still romance. They didn't go their separate ways. This isn't brave, but uh -huh. that's not ultimately what the movie was about. The movie was about two sisters who grew apart and then grow together once again. And I was just like, wow, that's unusual. That is, I, I can't remember seeing that before. Blue is the loveliest color. Okay. I guess... Uh... I can see that. I okay, but that lesbianism is quite the right word. I for need it, you to tell me your thoughts and your feelings, because I, as usual, have really hoarded over this conversation. <laughs> I've, I've, well, my shadow is dark and clawed. Yes, you've darkened this whole land with your shadow. Yeah, you know, I, I, I found that to be really refreshing too. That, that was, and I, sort of foresaw it, I guess. When they were like, oh, true love's kiss is what's going to save her or whatever. And it seemed to me, even at the time, no, that's not. It's not. That can't be what it's going to be. You know, it seemed like they're saying, oh, yeah, that's what the convention always is. So we're going to play and make you think that that's what's going to happen. But it's going to be something else. Just you wait. Watch the sea. Oh, ha, ha. Told you. Which I liked a lot. I liked that they took the convention and then turned it on its head so you know it's kind of like scream or something like that where they i mean they didn't come out and say well in all of these stories this is what happens so let's do that like they did in scream where they you know basically well, yeah shrek is the the disney scream right they basically explained the rule except for that i like scream yeah i like and scream it, too and deep down scream is still a horror movie right Although but, I guess deep down, Trek is probably still a fairy tale. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I liked that they took that convention and kind of turned it on its head. Without being really cynical about it like Shrek did. You know, I thought it was fun that they, you know, hey, this is how it normally is, but watch this. What, we, what if we did this? Huh? Well, what do you think of that? That was cool. 
I really appreciated that. And yeah, there's definitely this, and, and the whole time they, you had the romance with Kristoff, and you had the romance with bad guy, we can't remember his name, and they never seemed like there was enough of it, you know what I mean? For it to seem like, hey, this is what it's about. It always seemed like it was between the two sisters and they needed to resolve their issues and get their stuff working. So, I liked it a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I complained about some plot holes and about the uh, tie it up in a bow ending that there was. But, uh, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a good film. And Disney's actually got a pretty good track record now, recently. They've had Tangled, Wreck-It Ralph, and Frozen all in a row. It's gotten to the point where I trust in them perhaps more than I trust in Pixar to make a great film. Well, yeah. I, 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 is it that Pixar has been number one for so long that they may have become a little bit complacent? And Disney Animation Studios has been in the shadow of Pixar for so long that they're hungry. That they're the Mr. T, the uh, clubber Lang oh, that oh, comes and he sees that Rocky Balboa has become weak because he's been on top for so long. And they want it more. They have more to prove now. Now, granted, after Pixar has stumbled a couple of times one of these days they will get up and say you know what we're going to try harder than ever and you know maybe good dinosaur will be that it's like it took us an extra year to make good dinosaur great now we've changed the title to great dinosaur or maybe not maybe good dinosaur is mediocre we'll we'll see you know the world and of course we're americans and so we believe that the free market capitalists system is best but competition does breed better products it does breed innovation when you've got somebody you're competing with and you have something to prove you work harder and I really feel like with Wreck-It Ralph Tangled and Frozen that they've tried to elevate beyond what's merely acceptable or what is going to make them money to make something that will be worthy of remembrance 20 years from now. Which is something that Walt always did. He was the man that came up with that idea. Now, that was from necessity of re-releasing movies seven years later. It was because, you know, he had no money in the coffers after a couple of costly errors like Pinocchio or Fantasia. You can always bring them back. And if we make a movie good enough that every generation will love it, you know, we'll make money off these movies forever instead of just the opening weekend, which tends to be what everyone cares about in Hollywood. Perhaps that's the case. And I can't say that Pixar has really fallen on their face or anything like that. I wasn't a big fan of Cars 2. Monsters 2 was a good film. I enjoyed it. Uh, there were some parts that I really liked. But comparing Frozen and Monsters 2, which comes out on top? Probably Frozen just because it's original. I have to agree. I think Frozen tried harder. Now, Monsters 2 has that wonderful sequence in the real world with Sully and Mike, which elevates that from a good sequel to a great sequel or prequel, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but yeah, just Frozen really, really works. And it's magical. A lot of Frozen is like that sequence in the real world in, in Monsters 2. Yeah, I, I think that might be the real problem with Pixar is not that they're falling on their face. It's just that they're not original anymore. They are doing a sequel to Monsters and they're doing a sequel to Cars, doing a sequel to Toy Story. When they used to come up with something that would blow your mind with every film instead of just, oh yeah, here's those, those guys again. Remember them? You liked them a lot. Well, here they are again. And that's fine if you're making like two films a year and you got one that's like that and one that's so great and new and interesting and blows your mind. You know, like 
Monsters was the first time it came out, or Finding Nemo was, or etc., etc. Uh, I don't know, I think that's just kind of the problem, is that they feel like they've, or I feel like they've stagnated and they're just doing the same uh, characters over and over again, which is DreamWorks thing, you know? They do sequels to everyone. We've already got freaking Madagascar 3, when Madagascar 1 wasn't even very good. Rio 2? Rio 2 comes is out coming just out a month. soon, which was, you know, I mean, that's what any of those smaller studios, what is that, like Blue Sky or something? Oh, is like Rio that? not DreamWorks? It's Blue Sky? Yeah, it's not DreamWorks. That's a sm- even smaller one. But, you know, like Ice Age, you know, Fox got, it was it Fox or... Fox is Ice Age, yeah. Okay, yeah, Fox got Ice Age, and it was a hit, so they made Ice Age. They, they did a four, didn't they already do Ice Age? Yeah. Four? You know, they just, they, they get that, they strike gold, and then they're just like, oh, keep mining, keep mining. I'm sure there's more gold in there. And, uh... Well, Despicable Me was the, well, I thought it was the biggest animated film of the year. Probably, yeah. And Despicable it was a sequel. Me too. And they've already got the Minions flick with a release date. Yeah. It's, and it's, there's a new How to Train Your Dragon coming out. There's a new The Panda, Kung Fu Panda coming out. Oh, is there? Jeez. Uh, yeah, that's what the other studios do. They just, you know, rest on their laurels. They keep doing, once they get something that's good, they make Over the Hedge 2 or whatever. You know, they don't make something new. They make hoodwinked to (laughs) T-O-O and and that's what those ones do and now all of a sudden Pixar's doing that and that's why it seems like they're done they're not as great as they were maybe if we suddenly had Tangled 2 I would be like oh no you're kidding so far we haven't got that so maybe Disney is you know, they're the leader. They're they're uh, out there in front blazing the trail for all the other junk studios to follow with their junk. And I get... I know that I work with a bunch of single people who are, like, in their 20s, and so they're jaded, and they're, you know, they've seen it all, and they're... They think all that traditional stuff is stupid and whatever I it frustrates me to no end when I complain about well you've become the elder statesman at work all of a sudden yeah I have I'm, I'm pretty old it turns out but yeah it, it frustrates me when I talk about this whole thing and say oh yeah gosh you know when when that friend of mine was saying oh they started with the song and I just thought oh geez you know I am not one of those people that hates movies because they have songs in them. I'm not a person like that. I would watch, you know, Beauty and the Beast a hundred times to be spared from having to watch, you know, Despicable Me once. And of course, when I say that, somebody else sitting nearby listening, I was, oh, that Despicable Me was actually pretty good, though. It was, oh, yeah, Despicable Me too was, you know as good as Lawrence of Arabia I don't know just there's always the person who has to try oh no no DreamWorks are actually really good oh accident and waiting to happen that car is about to drive right up onto the back of the <laughs> the car carrying trailer yeah you know I hear that all the time too and these movies have made tons and tons of money and so obviously DreamWorks is ringing a chord with somebody it's it's speaking to somebody but every time I see a DreamWorks animated film it ends with a dance number with a modern song (laughs) and every time I see that uh, for example Despicable Me 2 ends with the minions singing I swear by All for One was it All for One? I have no idea but by John I, Michael Montgomery I do know the in song. their minion language does it really end with that? and it's terrible that ladies and gentlemen is a convention that they fall back on again and again and again that's as disgusting 
as the convention of the 70s sitcoms having their dynamite or a or sit on it or kiss my grits or what you talking about Willis and the audience going nuts just because of familiarity again there were probably people that really did think kiss my grits was funny or what you talking about Willis was funny but it chills my blood and uh when Mulan or Casper end with the dance number, those movies are diminished. They go down like a whole star because it's such a huge crutch. Uh, this this coming out of nowhere thing with the... We're going to have Little Richard sing the thing song to Casper the Friendly Ghost and then we're going to dance as the credits roll. Ugh! But in those days, it wasn't... I mean, they, I guess that's probably setting the precedent. Because, you know, DreamWorks does that because everybody liked it when they did it in Shrek. And so they did it in Shrek 2 and then every other DreamWorks film. All of them. Because I of that. I defy you to find one that doesn't do it. Um, I remember at the Casper end of... and Mulan are from I remember at Shrek. the end of How to Train Your Dragon when the dragon starts singing I'm Too Sexy for My Hat too sexy for this cat and I was just like wow the dragon didn't even speak you guys and now it's voiced by right said Fred <laughs> yeah I'm not sure how we got to this point frozen thumbs up but yeah I, I am one of those people that and I'm sure I, I know that for example Despicable Me really wasn't that awful I'm a little more prejudiced against those films than I need to be. Oh, so am I. Despicable Me 2, I'm not, I, I won't bother with. Despicable Me 1, from what I understand, it actually wasn't terrible. It's it, so fluffy. It's uh, not too bad. Other films, and I know even Rich has told me, no, that's actually good, you should see it. And don't be such a jerk. What, like, Megamind? Like Megamind, or... Megamind ends with them covering Bad by Michael Jackson and doing a dance number, too. Oh, yeah, I'm not saying they're not going to do the dance number, but the rest of the film, they probably aren't quite as bad as I make them out to be. But I'm so against them to begin with, and I'm like you at the start with my fist clenched, waiting for them to sing about whether I want to build a snowman or not. <laughs> um, but I'm my fists are clenched so much tighter, I think, when it comes to DreamWorks or anyone else. There are a few that I say, okay, you know, they're not so bad. I don't mind How to Train Your Dragon. I don't mind... So I even liked Rio. Of course, I have certain reasons why that I think other people wouldn't have. Yeah, I don't know. You it's, were it's, raised it's, by parrots, I remember. I was raised by parrots. All the same, I get upset by the... Similar, I don't know. I've lost my train of thought, so we're just going to say that's the end of the episode. Uh, frozen thumbs up. Good night. Thanks for listening, everybody. Build a snowman. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. Boy, they must really think a lot okay. of themselves. Okay, 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 where did that thing go? I'm going to wind up pulling in the plug out again. We're going to wind up crashing because of what the F just happened? Huh? What is the story with this guy in front of us?